Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, day three, we've got some work ahead and some fun stuff. I hope you all enjoyed dinner last night. And uh, with us this morning, as promised, uh, we have Timothy Harfield, who did uh, Lassie Local. Were you just on Monday or Monday and Tuesday, Tim? Uh-oh. Sorry, I just had to take a moment to, to do, take a selfie. Okay, good, good. And no, that's done. I'm, I'm more than happy to answer your question. So, uh, yeah, we were just on Monday. Uh, it was a day-long event, regional in focus. And explain the location. Tell us about how many folks you had there and describe a little bit about what you did on your day. Right. So this, uh, uh, the name of our local event was the Southeast Educational Data Symposium. This is the second year that we've uh, run the event. Last year we had 50 people, we capped it at 50, and we had representation from 25 different organizations locally. This year we extended the event, uh, we capped it at 100. Uh, again, we want to focus on regional uh, community, we wanted to create a, a size of an event that really was conducive to the formation of those sort of local communities. Um, so capped it at, at 100, uh, it was held in Atlanta, Georgia, at Georgia State University, uh, played host to to our local event. And really, really happy that this year, unlike last year, this year we could align ourselves with the Learning Analytics Summer Institutes um, because it, it meant that we could sort of retain our regional focus while at the same time engaging in an international conversation. So that was really important to us. And then can you uh, tell us a little bit about um, the, what the participants at your Lassie Local did with their time? Right, so the morning began with a keynote address from Chuck Zubin. Uh, Chuck is the director of the research in initiative for teaching effectiveness at the University of Central Florida. Uh, he's a, a gifted sort of data scientist and statistician, but also uh, a humanist at heart. And so he was able to speak to a wide audience about a, a wide variety of topics uh, talked a little bit about Tolstoy, talked, um, uh, and it was, was really engaging. So the, the morning began with that number of sessions in the morning, uh, dealing with everything from uh, how an institution is to deal with the cultural change in terms of readying itself for uh, large-scale learning analytics and analytics initiatives to uses of uh, sentiment analysis, uh, natural language processing. Um, so a, a wide variety of different topics meant to sort of stimulate the imagination of a group of people who are very, very interested in the use of analytics to promote student success in a sort of general sense, uh, but who didn't necessarily have uh, intensive experience with the data. So the morning was meant to stimulate the imagination. The afternoon, very much in the, st in the spirit of the Learning Analytics Summer Institutes, uh, we had a couple of workshops. The one workshop was the Practical Learning Analytics Workshop. Uh, very helpful to have data sets available from Tim McKay as a result of the Coursera MOOC. That was really a highlight for a lot of people. April Galliard, she led that. Um, and uh, at the same time, we ran another workshop uh, on actually uh, uh, codes of practice in the use of, uh, of educational data and learning analytics. And so that was sort of a design thinking exercise that was prefaced with a a 45-minute uh, presentation by Niall Sclater from JISC, and many of, of uh, the people in your group will likely be familiar with his work. Uh, so really interested in bringing some of his thinking into the American context and getting our people who are just at the very beginning of many of their projects thinking through some of these ethical concerns because all too often ethics is an afterthought and it should be at the front, forefront of people's minds as they engage in this stuff. And then, and then a panel concluded the day. So it was a very long day, very rich, um, people were exhausted by the end, but uh, eager for more. So that, that was a very good thing. Oh, that's really good news. I'm glad you were able to um, have uh, one workshop that was using the data for Michigan. We're, we're certainly happy to hear that. If um, you have any uh, fun things that came out of that workshop in terms of findings from the data, some things that people messed around with the data and produced some um, visualizations or statistical outcomes that they you know, did some testing on with the data or something and would like to be able to share that with us. Um, our session this afternoon is uh, the similar kind of activity from all the 10 different um, methodology workshops we've been running here over the course of the three days. Not all of them use the Michigan data. Um, some of them were doing things that they needed different sorts of data. 
Um, but I'd be happy if, if there's anything you would like us to feature from that workshop here this afternoon and want to send it to me, um, we'd be happy, happy to include it in some of the examples of what you can do with different methods uh, on student data. Um, well, thank Will you. Do. Thank you for checking in with us, and it was a pleasure to have you join us, at least briefly this morning. I'm uh, thrilled that you guys had a long and successful day and, and doubled your attendance. I think that's great. We're, we're um, at about almost 120 people here in total, which is in keeping with the numbers that we've had at the um, Stanford and the Harvard one. So um, I think uh, I'm happy that these Lassie locals this year and the uh, Central Lassie here have um, met our hopes in terms of attendance and participation and enthusiasm. Uh, everyone here was very excited. We had a long day. We were, there were people who stayed in their workshop past the five o'clock cutoff. So um, I'm glad that you had a similar sort of experience there. And thank you for joining us this morning, Tim. My, my pleasure. This, this really is a, an exemplary kind of event in an exemplary format that's being looked at very closely by not only us, um, but also by organizations like Gates, like Achieving the Dream, like the APLU. So this is a really important format, the sort of notion of integrating practice. You know, at famously, work, faith without works is dead, right? So to the extent that we can talk about these things, engage our imaginations and do, uh, that's really, I think, the way to, to uh, stimulate um, and encourage real and significant change. Uh, in the nation and internationally as well. And so I think the Lassie has been uh, really important and, uh, and uh, we're delighted to have been part of, part of it this year and look forward to being part of it successfully going forward. Great, thank you very much. Everyone, thanks, Tim. Bye-bye. <laughs> Great, oh, I think I've just initiated another call. Oh, look, looking good. Okay, <laughs> glad to hear that this morning. <laughs> okay, I'm on Brenda's computer. I don't really, uh, yeah, know how to work her not Apple machine. That, got it. Oh, <laughs> Brenda, I don't share that with our audience, um, which will actually be meaningful in just a minute. Where did that slide go, Brenda? Would you like to come and help me? <laughs> yeah, this one, this one right here. Okay, oh, I got it. I have my help, help, helper here. And then where is the, is it this one? It's that one. <sighs> there it is, there it is, yay. Okay, you don't even need to go very far. It won't be a long introduction. It is my great pleasure this morning to introduce you to our third and final keynote speaker for Lassie. I'm happy to introduce to you Brenda Gunderson, who received her PhD in statistics from the University of Michigan here. I don't have to say the year. that She stayed at U of M, where she is a senior lecturer. She coordinates and teaches the largest undergraduate statistics course, which is called Statistics and Data Analysis, which has um, to date, uh, well, at one point, 1,700 students, and you told me the other day, mm. higher than that, mm -hmm. very large number of students. And I think it's amazing that Brenda teaches this course, not just for the numbers, but uh, if you think about it, she's teaching statistics, not everyone's cup of tea, She's teaching it to students who maybe don't want to be there, many of them, maybe. Um, she is a woman instructor teaching statistics. As you can see, she's um, a petite <laughs> and not a very imposing physical fit. Uh, I'm, I'm botching what I wanted to say. Brenda is lovely. but. Would she make you scared when you walked in the classroom? Probably not, right? So you can see that she's already facing a number of potential difficulties as an instructor of an already very difficult subject to teach to people who don't want to be there. But why is Brenda there? And why is Brenda here speaking to us today? 
Well, for one thing is she's won numerous awards for teaching, starting back in 1999 when she won our Golden Apple Award, which is an award given to instructors here at Michigan that is solely nominated by students. So here's a statistics professor whose students nominated her <laughs> for the highest teaching award. She's gotten an award in uh, innovative use from our organization called Merlot. In 2011, she won the Provost Teaching Innovation Prize, so a prize that came from the Provost, uh, not just the students. She got a Sloan C Effective Practice Award in 2012. The, uh, this year, our Alumni Association sent out a little press release that they got from RateMyProfessor.com, and it was one of the top rated professors, and she was uh, on that list. So um, I think you're going to find her uh, talk today interesting and innovative. And yesterday, like when Tim introduced, uh, introduced Mark as his friend, I'm happy to introduce Brenda, not only as a fantastic instructor at Michigan, but also my friend. And this slide shows how we first knew each other. That's my older son, Anders, and her daughter, Emily, who went to preschool together. Mm -hmm. And this uh, lower corner is a picture of them taken a couple weeks ago when they both graduated from high school this year. So it's been a thrill to um, be able to count Brenda as a colleague and a friend and her daughter as a friend of my son's friend. So without further ado, Brenda. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am Brenda Gunderson, and I do teach statistics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so last week, I turned in my spring term grades, and that allowed me to see my final course evaluations, the end of term evaluations. And so I went in to take a look, only to find that item number four. I had a strong desire to take this course, was again my lowest rating on my evaluations. I'm even below the first quartile. So, I like to share a picture in my class. I like to share a little mental floss in, during my lecture time, a picture of the day or a comic of the day. So I wanna share with you that first this morning, my very favorite picture of the day. I share this on my day one of lecture every semester. There it is. Mm -hmm. And that is my son, and nephew, and it was part of a calendar of family pictures that was up on the wall in my office. And I had a student who was in my office, looked at that picture and said, that's kind of what I looked like when I learned I had to take your stats class. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I've added references to the course that I teach, Stats 250, an introduction to statistics and data analysis for undergrads. But I share that story because the student was not in my office for the first time. She had come to my office hours during the semester. She had asked questions. She had attended the lectures and labs. She had decided which resources of those available were going to be useful for her learning style and made use of them. And so now she was in my office at the end of the term because I had sent her a letter because she received an A+. Our STATS 250 team will send an individual email with a letter attached to all students that get an A+, in the course asking them to come back in so that we can congratulate them in person, so we can talk to them a little bit more, so we can get some idea of what their personal learning experience was in our course. Great opportunity to get some data one-on-one. -on -one. I thought I would share a little bit about the course just to give you background of what it's like through the academic reporting tools, a place where we get a lot of information and can use that to make some decisions. And it is a one semester course. It's an analysis of data viewpoint. Uh, the background is only high school algebra, no calculus required for the class. We do have a computer lab, so that's why it's a four credit class. I mainly have sophomores in the class, freshmen and juniors there too. As far as which major they end up going out with that have taken my class, mostly psych, neuroscience, some econ, business and poli sci but it is a large class, as you heard. Our enrollments last winter term were over 2,000, and right now our fall term coming up looks like it's gonna be a record enrollment too, and this is without all the freshmen enrolling that are going through orientation right now. So it is a large class, and it's coordinated. 
So there's a number of lecture sections. I'll teach a few of them in a room similar to this style with about three, 400 students in it. And then we have about 65 computer lab sessions that are run, and those are maybe 30 to 40 students. And I have a wonderful Army team of graduate student instructors that teach this course with me for these weekly labs. But I want to show you that large classes are great for a number of reasons. And to do that, I want to actually start with an activity, so something I do in my classroom. And for that, you need something to write with and something to write on. What you write on is any scrap piece of paper, that's fine. Something to write with, this is not something you can type. You need to actually have that tactile. We're going to do a quick little handwriting activity. Very short. We're going to see how long it takes you to print your name. All right, so there were some pens on the desk out there. If you need to run out and grab one, I did bring some extras. But if you've got something to write with, something to write on, I'm going to give you a go, and then the seconds will go by up front. So as soon as you're done printing your first and last name, then look up front to see your time and record that, okay? Everyone understand the task? Ready, go. Some of us have long names, okay. So you have your first observation, right? Did you write that down so we don't forget that data point? All right, so now we're gonna do it again, but this time, switch hands. All right, opposite hand. Let's see now how long it takes you to print your first and last name. Ready, go. All right, you have your second observation, yes? So I'd actually like you to calculate the difference, right? How much longer did it take you to print with your opposite hand compared to your regular hand? That's the value we're gonna be using. And I have a theory about this. But in order to assess that theory, we should use more than one observation, your own observation. We like big data here, right? Lots of data, okay? So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds, which means you might have to get up and move so that you can gather a little bit of data from those around you to say good morning, to introduce yourself if you happen to not know that person yet after these few days, but you've got about 30 seconds to collect a little bit of data so you can use that to help me make a decision. Ready, go. Another 20 seconds or so. <laughs> All right, everyone, let's gather back together. Because I have a theory. I think that was the most active data gathering I've ever seen in a, my class. Love it. All right, so now you have some data in hand. I know, I know. And I would like your help in assessing this theory. My theory is that on average, it takes about three seconds longer to print your name with your opposite hand. What do you think? Based on your data, how many of you would like to support this theory? Based on your data, how many of you would like to reject this theory? overwhelmingly. Did you all have the same observations? No. Were there some threes in your data set? Maybe. But still, with the observations we made, 
being a three in the data set, but with that variability, we still overwhelmingly decided to reject this theory. We took a look at our data, we compared it to the theory and said, you know, if that theory were true, then our data would be really unusual, unlikely to occur. Our data is not compatible with this theory, so we ended up rejecting it. This is an activity I can do in my large classroom setting. And we can just start talking about how decisions are made with data. And get them excited about being able to learn the methods that we're going to learn in that class to be able to do some data analysis. You can do this in a large classroom. Large classrooms are great. All right. How lucky am I that I get to teach statistics? Mm -hmm. The science that transforms that data into useful information so we can make decisions with it. And if you think about the life of a student throughout college, it's a long series of decisions that they have to make, actions that they have to take. I have been teaching here for over 25 years, a long time, and a lot has changed. Here's one of my earlier years, pictures of our department and students. There I am, front row, yes I am short, and I could only find a black and white picture, that's all we had. Here's a few years later, it's in color now, but I'm still in the front row and I'm still short, and I'm even wearing, I think, the same outfit. <laughs> I know, I know. And here's a few years later, more recent. I'm still in the front row, so I'm still short. A little better outfit, I think. But there has been a lot that has changed over these years of my teaching. I have my students do a lot of things in my class. And of course, we have the basics of coming to lecture, of working on homework. We have a lab that they go to, and the assessments that we have in the class. And more recently, we've added in a few other pieces, such as a quick pre-lab activity they do before going to lab. We've given them a host of practice tools now that they can work with that are not required in the course, but the option to use those tools. And then a really nice, wonderful tool for guiding our students through our course called eCoach. And I thought today I would share a few of these pieces with you and show you a little bit about how having data available has been very useful for me as an instructor to be able to make decisions, to be able to guide my teaching, and how having a lot of data together has also been available or helpful for influencing the learning experience of my students and the decisions that they have to make. So a little then and now. Working with the lectures first. Well, back then, my lectures were still considered big. We had about 600 students all together, but I still taught in a room like this with about 200 students. So they looked something like that. Back then, when I was teaching, I used that device. I was a master of the overhead. I really was. The students had kind of a workbook style, and I had the same content on an overhead, and we would work through the content together. We would complete their workbook, their study guide together. And I still do that today. My classes are still big. And I'll get down and walk around, and they're going to be working on activities, even in the classroom. I use, of course, my tablet now that I can interact with and write on to complete our work together, and I can even save that content. But one of the things I do use in my lectures are clickers. Now, I know clickers are not new technology. It's not fancy. It is not sophisticated. But I still can learn a lot from my students. It's really easily collected data that gives me information that's useful. I don't have them required to come to lecture. I don't use the clicker data for attendance specifically. It's not part of their course grade, but it still provides data that's quite useful. Simple in form, easily obtained, binary, zero. They did not click in. They did not participate, likely because they did not attend. Or one, they did. Turns out this past spring term, we found another use for this clicker data. I had five GSIs, they were all experienced GSIs, graduate student instructors that have taught this course with me. And one of them, in our weekly training and planning meeting, said I was having some difficulty with my students getting that in-lab project done. And there was some frustration among the groups, because there's teams to work on these projects, and some of them were being a little frustrated. And so he was doubting, you know, do I need to come up with a better overall review that I give at the beginning? Do I need more little detail there? Or, did you cover topic X in class already before lab? Because my students didn't seem to you know, understand that. Yes, I had. We had covered it and finished it on that Wednesday lecture before the lab in the afternoon. So we took a look at the data. We looked at the lecture clicker data. I had not shared this data with my graduate students before because for one thing, it's not something that I look at regularly because I'm not taking attendance. 
I use it in other ways, pedagogical reasons. But we looked at the attendance data, and of course it was not a surprise that some students weren't coming to class. And some of the students might have been looking at the captured lecture of my course, but not necessarily before they went to lab. So they were missing that material that had been presented that they were supposed to engage in initially that was going to be covered in more detail in the lab. And when we looked at it broken down by the lab section, he found his lab section, having the highest percent of students who had not been going to the lectures regularly to get that material before coming to their lab. So data doesn't have to be very sophisticated and it doesn't have to be hard to collect and manage and put together. It can be actually quite simple and easily obtained and still be useful to an instructor. Now, there is incentive for the students to do those quick clicker questions that I have in the class that are on content just to get them to you know, practice an idea, see how they're doing. The incentive is that if they get 100%, I do a cartwheel. That's what I promise. If they have a question that's 100% correct, I will do a cartwheel. So I went through my captured lectures and I found one. Would you like to see it? Okay, all right. So this is just from last winter term. And then a final example on dark chocolate being good for you, as I mentioned. So I owe you one. It's coming I up. Them one. But I do want to remind you of your name that scenario practice tool, a really good tool. And okay, here we go. Thank you, and we'll see you on Thursday. And then I had, later that week, after I did that cartwheel in class, I got an email from a student. It was at 1.30 in the morning on Saturday. They had just watched my lecture that would have been captured and stated that my cartwheel was legendary, so very nice. And I had a backup one, just in case the first one didn't show right. This is one that we did actually in the greenhouse studio when we had done some recording where I was explaining to students how my pieces fit together and they decided that I needed that incentive and have a video at the end so that if they made it through, they would see that cartwheel at the end. So this one's got a little more drama to it because I didn't do all this editing. <laughs> all right. So indeed. There have been some classes where they don't see a cartwheel, and there's been even one section that actually saw three in the same semester, which is pretty rare. They did a really great job. All right, another component in the class is, of course, homework. Homework in the past was on paper, sometimes a one-sheet worksheet, two-sided, or we even allowed them to do it in blue books a couple times, but we collected it in person, right? They turned it in in lab, or when we had so many labs over a long week, we had to collect them at one time in mailboxes, and the GSIs would grade them and give them some feedback, record a score somewhere, and turn it back to the students. I never saw that homework unless they came to office hours to ask a question about it. I often didn't always see the score either until later when we had course management sites that allowed us to have multiple sections in one grade book and things like that. Nowadays, we have many tools that allow us to have homework done online. And we have a homework tool that's called Coursework that um, has been something that I've been able to help in the development side too. Been able to help decide what do my students need to see and what are some features that would be helpful for them and from the instructor in the graduate student side too. What I do like of course is that it open and closes at one time for all students and no student ever loses their homework. It's always there to go back to. That my GSIs have the ability to go in and interact. We can have a common rubric set up for the GSIs. We can still give them feedback. They have to go in and grade the ones where the students have to actually do work and type up conclusions and such. And then all of the auto-graded ones for the multiple choice are done automatically. I love it because as a student, I can see a homework. I can pull up a dashboard for a student and take a look at whether they've been doing the homework, what their scores were, and a lot of other data that's available too. It allowed me to think about some questions that I wanted to answer. I mean, I always thought, you know, students should really start doing their homework earlier, right? It's open for a whole week. They can start working on it right away when it opens. So do they really wait until the last minute? Do some of them start it earlier? And I put together this recommended homework for them. 
that they don't have to do, but are they making use of it? Are they using it during that week, the homework that they have to do is being done? Or are they waiting to use it later, before exams, or not at all? And the dashboard for a student would allow me to see some of that information. It would allow me to see that this student generally opened their homework about three or four days before it was due. And that they opened up and looked at and interacted with every one of those recommended homeworks I had up there too. And then we have student B, who opened it typically a few hours before it was due, night before, maybe that morning of, due at 8 a.m., and never opened up one of the recommended homeworks. So it does allow me to see a little bit more about that student. And of course, this data then can be collected and exported so I can do some work with it. It was this data that we decided to take a look at from a previous term and create a nice image that we provided to the students in a message about homework, the five juicy facts of homework. And this was the image that was created, showing students who generally worked on the homework much earlier on the left to students who started working on the homework much closer to the due date. And that students who worked on it earlier generally had not only higher scores on that homework, but also higher results in the class. And you would think that if a student is opening the homework earlier, then they're going and interacting with that more often during that time. And that's how we also learn, by going back and reviewing and recycling and not just trying to get something done right at the last minute. So we were able to provide this graphic. And I'll show you the full homework message that we sent a little later. The takeaway from this is that I think it's really valuable to have instructors as part of the team because we have questions that we want to know and therefore data that would be helpful for us to be collected. And based on what we learned, it's important for us to take the responsibility, to take appropriate action and to provide this information to students in a good way for them to make an informed decision, informed choices, create opportunities for them to change those habits if they need to, to do better in the course. How about a quick look at the exams? Exam many years ago and one more recent. They don't look that different from the front page. I still give them on paper, all right? It's not bubbling in. They still have to write up answers to questions. They still learn regression analysis in the class. We use R now instead of SPSS. And we still grade them as a big instructional team. Wonderful grading experiences that we have. And so we grade and we give the students back their paper that's marked up. But I still, as an instructor, typically don't get to see all of those exams. And once they're passed back to students, unless they had a question about something on points or something, they typically don't bring that in very often either. So I'm really excited about a new thing that we're going to be piloting for a future source of data, which is to send those exams that are graded out and have them scanned in. And then they're returned to students electronically, and we can still get the hard copy back too. But it does allow me to have this extra piece of information about our students. So that if a student wants to meet with me and they're talking about you know, what strategies can I do to help you know, do better on the next exam, we can take a look at their exam. I can take a look at their exam and see how they were working through those problems. So this is gonna be another source of data. We don't lose those exams and that information about how that assessment was for them. We can pull out scores from various parts of these questions and use that data. So that's something that's coming up. We just tried it in the spring term and the students did like having it returned to them soon electronically, but they also like to have that tactile paper back too. So we get them back and turn them back to them. Now there is an interesting um, source of data that we have that ties in with exams. We collect it on exam day and exam evening. We use Yik Yak. Mm -hmm. We monitor it on the exam days and exam nights. This is the sign I put up when the GSIs, my grad students were coming back with their bins of exams and unloading everything, I have them get into Yik Yak and start taking a look at what students are saying. Remember, I've got 2,000 students that have taken the exam, and they will let me know how they think about that exam. Mm -hmm. So here's a couple of captured yak. Is it yaks? Is that what you call it? All right, well, I will go in sometimes, because they're already talking about it before the exam starts, and I'll go in and tell them, good luck. Mm -hmm. May the p-value be in your favor. It's one of my grad students. Good. And then after the exam is done, we'll get some feedback. We'll find out which question they thought was not easy. What was the name of that statistical value calculated? Power? Was it power of the test? That's what I put. Here's one about the turkey question. It was famous. It was a Thanksgiving time frame, so we gave them a question that had to do with turkeys. 
And again, we can also go in though and monitor because you know that evening we have early regular exams and late. So we have to kind of watch what's being shared and we can vote down if comics are, or comments are not appropriate too. But it does give us a feel for, okay, we're gonna have to maybe go over that turkey problem and explain that concept to students and maybe do that as the review that they get in lab when they get their exams back. That stats exam, this one had great personality supposedly. But your data doesn't have to always come from a course management site. It can be attained in other resources and still give us information, uh, an vibe on how that exam assessment went for our students. All right, seventh inning stretch. So I thought we'd have another activity. But this one, you don't need a pen and pencil. This one, you just need to know how to count, okay? You need to know your alphabet, maybe, okay? Because the activity is going to be then I'm gonna put up a sentence. And you're gonna have about 10 seconds to count the number of times you see a certain letter in that sentence. And I'll tell you what letter that is, okay? And then just keep that number in your head and we'll see how we did. So I would like you to count the letter F as in Frank. Ready? Go. All right, time's up. How many did you see? You saw three? How many saw three? How many saw four? How many saw five? How about six? What happened? You got it. I use this activity to talk about sampling and that even when we can't look at the entire population, sometimes, even when we can't look at the entire population, sometimes we still don't get the right answer. And we'll talk about designing good studies. We'll talk about the collaborative team that's needed to design a good experiment and biases that we want to avoid and the responsibilities of researchers. And you want to know how many it is, right? And it is indeed the ofs. Mm -hmm. There are six altogether. And so as I said, we'll talk about the need for a team effort that we need to take some risks, but we need to make sure we take on the responsibilities when designing statistical studies, figuring out what questions we want to ask and what data to collect, and that it really does take a collaborative effort. All right, so just a fun activity that we can again do in classroom and get it to talk about other things that are important. And one of the things that's important for me is the ability to have a team, a team to help me figure out what questions am I interested in, what data should I collect, and the ability to have people like you that work with that team so that that data can be collected and looked at in appropriate ways. The final quantity I want to talk a little bit about is eCoach. And eCoach is definitely a place where there was a team effort, collaborative effort. And what I've been able to bring to my students through this particular tool has been amazing, but could not have happened without many, many members. So eCoach, electronic coach. It's created opportunities for us to gather a lot of information and to provide that information to our students. I think Tim mentioned that it's gonna allow you to be able to sort of have that conversation with every one of your students if, as if they came into office hours during that term to talk through how they were doing. And so as soon as that was said, I said, I'm on board. It's a tool that helps our students do their best in our Stats 250 class. A personal coach, it gives them advice, it gives them that sort of inside strategies on tools for studying. Gives them hints for the exams. It gives them a grade calculator that's specifically to how I do their course grades, which have a couple methods so that if they don't do as well on an assessment, it can be a learning experience throughout the class. And they can go in and see how they're doing and do some what if scenarios. And it, it employs evidence-based tools that help to boost their performance. So this is the actual snapshot of the homepage from the spring term with the various messages that they received during the semester. And one of the things that's really cool about this tool is that we're giving them information and, and strategies that they don't not only need in the course itself, but they can take to other courses and to other areas of their life. And one of those things is the, oh, let me go through a couple other things first. Uh, advice from students, past students, I remember the first semester we did eCoach, we had to remind the students that it wasn't a machine that was writing these messages. 
that it was actually the instructors that were writing the messages and using the information that they shared with us that we knew about them to tailor what they saw. This is a student who was giving them information about all those resources, and there's too many, so you can't use them all, so pick the ones that are going to work right for your learning style. And that it's personalized that when they take the data from their homework and the Canvas and their, their student record, and they sign up and share a little bit more with us, we can give them some wonderful personalized messages and allow them to see how they're doing relative to the class throughout the, to the course. The Get Things Done list is one of those tools that they have. I prepare a list of what a student should be doing during that week coming up to be on top of things in the class. This Get Things Done list is something that they can check off. They can print if they prefer. Some students put it in their binder cover and had it in hardcover to actually print off and check off. And it includes, of course, the things that we know they have to do. That get, start that homework, get that pre-lab assignment done. But it'll also include things to help motivate their behavior. Like, there's office hours, remember? There's 48 office hours every week that you can go to. So why don't you stop by, pick a day and time, just find out where that location is so that you're more likely to go back to that resource for you when you do have questions. And we try to throw in a fun one, too, something like sending them to a video or a short article that ties in with what they're learning in our course. But it certainly gives them a model that they can use. And I've had students tell me that they've you know, used this concept to help them manage their time and duties in other classes too, beyond just this one course. What's very cool is that we can take the data about students using this type of tool and provide it back to my students through a homework assignment, which is what we did. We took data de-identified from a previous term about usage of the Get Things Done list, about usage of another practice tool that we have through eCoach, put it in their hands to start doing some data exploration, to look at and compare the users versus non-users or the extent of the use and how they did in that course as a whole so that they can basically explore the data and see the messages themselves. And it's coming from students like them. Here's that homework message I mentioned. We had that graphic that we put in. It's the five juicy facts about homework. This message is tailored. This was for a Daniel who, we said, your hard work is amazing. We see that you did the practice homework, and you did homework one, but your score was a little on the low side. Well, we dropped the lowest homework score, so let's learn from our mistakes, and we're going through some tips. Tips such as you need to practice, so there's that recommended homework available to you. Tips that include thinking about the process of doing the homework. It's not just when they start the homework, but it's also how they do the homework. I had a student who came in to pick up their final exam. This was not an A-plus student, but a student who ended up doing quite well in the course, a B-plus, after starting at a D on exam one. And I said, so when I looked at his record as he was coming in to look over his exam, I said, so what did you do that was different? And he explained how he changed up his homework strategy. And so I said, could you... Right. Can we write that down? Could you, can I videotape your explaining that? So we could include that as a testimonial to the students. And there are other students in that same situation. Homework's a big part of your grade. Use it, though, as that study tool, that productive practice. And then we can give them a third fact about, why don't you just think about starting homework a little earlier? Just open it up, read the questions, and then start working on it as you interact later through the term, through the week. So this image that was there and some information about that data that we had summarized for them. That students who got that A usually started their homework about how many days on average before it was due. Helping to them make decisions about how they want to behave in the course and how they want to act and that they can make those choices. This homework message looks so much better than it was the first time. It's an iterative process. It has been wonderful to have a health behavioral scientist, a lead in this e-coach team, that would come to me and say, Brenda, tell me about homework. Just tell me what you want your students to do. What are, what are the pieces? And she would help me figure out the right ways to say these things. And we would look at the data that we could use to back it up, our recommendations. So I, I mean, I can say these things, but to have a person who knows how to say those words that are motivational to our students in the appropriate way, 
has allowed us to make wonderful messages that have truly been an iterative process, looking so much better and still room for improvement too. But that need for a collaborative team is important. And then my final sharing is, well, it's been a wonderful to be part of this team because it's given us opportunities to do educational research. And what I'll share quickly is something that I worked on initially with Patricia Chen in my course that has now come to be a piece of eCoach called the Exam Playbook. The idea that we want them to think carefully about the resources they have to use to study for exam, which ones should they be using for their studying, and why, why would that be helpful for them? And then, of course, to lay out a plan, right? Because if a student, a student puts on their get things on the study for exam, what does that mean? And they don't even know sometimes how to study. So we can think about here are the various resources. Think about which ones you're going to be using and why would you want to use that one. Make them write a blurb out about them, helping them to productively think about that strategizing and planning of resource use. So this is the couple of screenshots of what it's going to be looking like, hopefully in the fall, some ideas of that. And again, it's come a long way too from this iterative process. They have a goal that they would set. And we'll ask them some questions about how they feel with this upcoming exam. We'll ask them to choose your tools from a list that we have available and make them write something about those tools as to why they pick them and how they're going to be useful. Because research shows thinking about why you're going to use a resource helps you to get better grades. And to make a plan, right? Boy, if we can break it up into pieces that are digestible, that we put into our calendar to get something done, it's more likely to get done. And then they have a playbook, an exam playbook that they can go back to a summary to look back and tweak as needed, but they're more likely when it's put into their calendar to get some of those use of those resources, those practice exams, the reviewing of recommended homework, more likely to have a positive effect in the end. Why do I do all these things? I will not say that it doesn't take any effort at all. It takes effort, but it's a great effort. It really is. I mean, if I'm gonna ask my students to come to my class to do their personal best, then I, as an instructor, need to be willing to do the same. And doing my personal best means I need to be open to some innovation. Needs to be, means I need to be open to you know, bringing in that data and learning analytics and reporting appropriately to my students, things that can help guide their behavior, allow them for making improvements. And I will say that this is not disruptive to my teaching. It doesn't disrupt your teaching. It actually enhances your teaching. And as we've seen from examples, it doesn't have to be sophisticated and, and huge. It can be very simple, too, and that the team really makes a difference. So I would certainly need to make sure I thank some of the members of my village that has allowed me to do some of the things that I've been able to do in my classroom. Wouldn't have happened to get this data to be available and then useful and actionable in my class if I didn't have many members to help me. And then I would like you to give a round of applause right now. And that round of applause is for each of you, all right? It is, because you have been here now for two whole days, going on the third. You have been thinking and working and learning about new ways to look at data and make use of data and methodologies, and it, these things wouldn't get done without you. So I thank you for what you have come here to learn and get excited about and do, and I hope this inspires you to know that it's, it's important, it's got a purpose, it helps instructors like me be a better instructor and learn more from my students and it helps my students to have a good guided experience in my class. So thank you. And I will thank you. And we're not supposed to ask, you know, do you have any questions? We're supposed to ask what questions do you have, right? All right. And of course I don't have the handheld mic or we don't have the cube. So if you oh, could repeat. Uh, Oh, no. Oh. Uh, yes. If you, wait. Oh, these guys are great. There we go. I will take this out to the audience okay. because we are taping, so it's helpful if uh, we can capture the questions. Who's got a question for Brenda? Oh, okay. Abelardo. This is how I get my Fitbit steps in. <laughs> it's great. 
Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I, I enjoyed it a lot because I teach a first year course, engineering, 300 students, and mm -hmm. I know exactly that scenario, how to get them engaged and all these things. Um, the question I have for you is if you could elaborate a little bit more your feedback. I like the idea of giving them feedback about their strategies and the study techniques, but how do you manage to personalize those messages with respect to your cohort of 2,000 students? Because you are observing quite a lot of different behaviors and the feedback has to be personalized to their specific situation. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit more about that. Right, so we've been using eCoach to gather a lot of this information about which resources are they using. We ask them to go back in and then after the exam to tell us which ones they did use. And we can use that data to form messages about which of these resources were used by students who did well in the class and mention that you selected these resources, but we have found that a lot of students have um, this resource to be more useful. Why don't you consider putting that into your, your plan? So we can look at the feedback we've gotten from previous terms, use that to also guide students that maybe they picked these three, but they didn't try any practice exams. And practice exams were rated as one of the best tools to use by students in the past, so why don't we suggest that to you in a message? Mm -hmm. Good morning, Dr. Gunderson. Good morning. When you shared with your cohorts that if they engaged with the homework up to five days earlier, there was at least a correlation that their final score would increase. Let's call that an intervention. What then happened? Did they adopt your recommendation and did you track it? Well, we are certainly able to. The ability to look at this timing data was something we recently just did. It was available at the end of winter term, or was it end of fall term? And so we were able to start to look at that data and presented this message just this last winter. So we have not taken a look at the effect of that on the winter term data yet to see the students change after that message was done, but we do have that data available. There's an issue with just too much data out there and not enough time for an individual instructor to do as much. So when we have a team and we have certain questions that we want to address, we can get into that data and look at it. Oh, well, this is uh, it's work for the for the structure, but also it's work more work for the students. What's the percentage? Or, or, or what's your how you feel that the students are taking this? They are required to do more work, to be more organized, to follow through these plans. Are they doing that? Which percentage of your students are engaged by this? Which percentage are like I don't care? Mm -hmm. As far as eCoach goes, when we did it the first couple semesters, it was just an offering to them. We had a little promo video where we explained what it was, and we, I would mention it in lectures every once in a while. There's a new eCoach message out there, so if you haven't signed up yet, you still can, but it was not required for the course. And we had a pretty good sign-up rate of 70 to 80% in those first couple terms. This past spring, I decided to give them two extra credit points to sign up for eCoach, so that they would sign up for it and they would have the messages available to them. And it was quite amazing at how much just getting them to sign up made them go there initially and then use the information. We had a higher rate of usage of the Get Things Done list. We had a higher rate of reading the messages. Much more interaction just by making them all be aware of it by going to sign up initially. So, so they had I am, to sign up, but they didn't have to use it. They didn't have to use it. There was no other points attached to the items that were within it, but it was there and available to them all the time. And I have a link to it on the front page of our Canvas site so that they could always go right to it to check it. You know, a little reminder from me that says, hey, there's a new message out there in lecture. They might go and check, but it was definitely a change in the rates of usage of each of the items that we had available to them by just simply making them sign up for a couple extra credit points. But beyond that, it's nothing's required for using it. And they can see from the data when they analyzed it, the Get Things Done list, there were non-users. There were some who used the first Get Things Done list and then not after that. It's not for everyone. And you know, there's lots more we can do there too to be able to change that list based on they already turned in their homework. Oh, then we don't need to have that homework one there or it could be checked for them. 
lots of things we could think about doing still. Hi, thank you very much. Um, it's very, very uh, informative. Uh, quick question. So, you mentioned that you got some help in t in tailoring these messages. Did you? What did you learn about? sort of the rhetoric or how you communicate and how you motivate that you didn't know before that you learned through this, um, through this platform? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, Holly, lead behavioral scientists know how to frame things. They know how to say things better and just make it more tantalizing. I mean, five juicy facts about homework? I want to know what those are. Three things you need to know about the name that scenario tool, this practice tool. I want to know what they are because they're three, you know, she helped it to not be so much words and help it to pull up the salient features and make them the important thing that made a person want to read that message. And she would just listen and take some of the things that I said and be able to put them in the right frame. So I think I would have, you know, made a nice message to the students, but not in that engaging way that she knows how you need to phrase something to make them think about changing their behavior, to make them look at and read that piece of information. So again, I don't think I could do the message writing as well as we have been without that person being a member of the team. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm always interested in how uh, social media now can be an add-on or uh, an alternate way of learning, learning the wild sort of thing. So you looked at the, the um, yik yak around exam time. First of all, I mean, it, from what you know from that, I mean, are they, are they actually learning from that? But also, is there stuff going on during the term, or are they actually engaging in discussion about the class? Uh, and, and these, I mean, I know it's going around exams or around assignments, which is a good trigger for that. But yeah, just if you, what, what's happening out there in social media? Yik yak, something we just brought in. It was my graduate student lead that said, hey, you know, they're yakking about your exam. I was like, what? What is this? So I learned what that was, and we've monitored at that point. Some of the graduate students do bring some of the information to me that they find. We um, have incorporated into the Canvas tool just a chat feature that allows us to do some virtual office hours and things, and so they can still use that at different times so we can see that backlog. With 2,000 students, I haven't done, you know, large-scale um, discussions and letting them just run with that. Um, not able to monitor that quite as well. Um, Yik Yak is something that I haven't you know, followed, but just found it useful to get some you know, right in time information about what they're thinking about those assessments. We haven't done much more than that, but it's still a step in the right direction to be aware of how they're communicating with each other. Get a, it's interesting, our office hour time is in this big room where we can let them just drop in, and I now hold my office hours there too because I get so much more information about what they're thinking and how they're studying and how they're working with their, their neighbors and their teams by being in that setting than just in my own office where they come in too. So I get a little bit more feel of how they're working on material and sharing ideas with each other. We have time for one more question right here. Thank you. So uh, you showed a graph that was relating the scores and when they started on their homework as an example. And that could uh, lead students to a couple of different conclusions. One might be that you can put more work and do better quality work um, if you start earlier. And the other is that students with higher self-regulation um, are able to also perform better. Um, and that is a little bit of a more, uh, I don't know if that's something that students would feel that they could change as much. And that's something I think learning anal analytics can work on to tease that out. But if it is more related to a non-cognitive factor to their self-regulation and engagement as an instructor, what does that um, lead you to want to do with your class? So I, it would lead me to come up with ways to get them to just get started on the homework. So, okay, look over the homework before our next lecture because we're going to take a look at those first two questions and to guide them to just getting that process being part of their, their weekly plan is that they look over questions, just reading them before the next class and having that be an assignment from me, but it's not an assignment where they get points at all, but I can still model that behavior to help them to interact with that tool. We could tailor the message to go to certain students and not to other students in terms of whether they need to see that type of message or not. But I think when you can explain the pedagogical reason behind interacting with material more often 
and then more times throughout that week is going to be, in general, a better way for learning, then that's just something that maybe they hadn't really thought about because they didn't really get that modeled as well in high school or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So in learning science terms, I think I would suggest you scaffolding how to be, how to be a better self-regulated learner and the system helps. Mm -hmm. Having to get things done is to remind you. Sometimes it's just a reminder to do some things because you get very busy too. Great. Well, that's all we have time for. We'll, we'll come up on a break next. And then um, first, let's thank Brenda for her keynote this morning. Thank you. As I had hoped that this would be um, a little motivation for you on your final drive. You're working this morning for your last two, two hours in your workshops on your methodologies. I hope that this helped inspire you. Like, why are we doing this, right? We want, in learning analytics, we always say we want it to be actionable. I think Brenda has provided us with some really concrete evidence on how instructors can find the kinds of things that we do very actionable. So uh, go forth. Back, so you're going to be in your workshop rooms this morning. We don't meet back here at all. Hopefully the other rooms are warmer today. And so we'll have a, uh, your, do your workshop after the break. We'll have lunch where we always have lunch. And then we will be staying uh, in the ballroom for our concluding afternoon sessions. And remember, you're, we're reporting back. So do some more good work this morning and come back with something to talk about after lunch. Thank you.